Well, what's up, Internet? It's me. I'm back again. Warren E. Freeman Jr., Yes Admin, on Facebook.com. And this is episode 12 of Warren's Vlog. And what am I talking about today? Well, I'm talking about WrestleMania 27. Oh, yeah. If I were going to describe this WrestleMania to, uh, to a historian of wrestling, I would describe this WrestleMania as... WrestleMania 11 with a bigger budget. And I reviewed WrestleMania 11 on here before, and if you guys watched that video, then you know how utterly disgusted I was after watching it. Like, I felt like I needed to take a shower. It was, like, that bad. And WrestleMania 27, uh, I mean, at comparison, quite frankly, is not that much better. Um... So let's get in right into it. Uh, this was held in the Georgia Dome in Atlanta, Georgia, and The Rock was the host. Little backstory here: uh, The Rock had made his return about a, to the, his return to the company about a month ago, and more or less declared war on John Cena. Really, because I guess during The Rock's absence, there was uh, disparaging remarks, um, justifiable, justifiable in my opinion, but. Disparaging, disparaging nonetheless, where Cena basically said, in so many words, don't fuck me around. Um, if you love the WWE, prove it. And I think this happened around the time of the 15th anniversary of Raw where The Rock didn't show up, and that's kind of where all this started. So, um, let's get right in, let's get right into it. Uh, we open up with a Rock promo. And let me just be the first one to say, listen, I love The Rock. I've always been a Rock fan. And whenever The Rock speaks, it's gold. I mean, The Rock could sell this shirt to me already. He, he could sell water to a fish. He'll tell the fish, no, this is, this, 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 this is not just normal water or regular water. This is the people's water. And you bet your ass that fish is going to buy that damn water anyway. Um, I kind of butchered it a little bit. Anyway, The Rock cut a promo, and the only problem I kind of have with this is that Daniel Bryan and Sheamus were kicked off the card in favor of this. And, you know, I'm a wrestling fan, and as much as I love The Rock, I would have much rather have seen Daniel Bryan and Sheamus than a Rock promo. Or, I mean, I don't see why you couldn't put both on there. But, anywho, we start off with a Rock promo... Then we get into um, Edge versus Alberto Del Rio. Edge defending the World Heavyweight title. And this just goes to show how important that belt is. is kicking off the biggest show of the year. But it was really around this time where you really began to, seeing, to see how unimportant the uh, World Heavyweight Championship was. Because it's kicking off. It kicked off a lot of pay-per-views that this year. And uh, so, yeah. Um, it's kind of wild watching this knowing that this was Edge's last match. And, uh, watching it back, you can kind of tell that Edge knew this was his last match because he went all out. He did a over-the-top rope plunger senton move that you don't see Edge do very much. Um, it, the whole, the match was amazing. I'm looking at my notes as I'm looking down. Um... The best heels are natural. The best heels are people who are just naturally just look that way. And I'll, and I'm not saying that people who can't transform transform themselves aren't good either. Um, but Alberto Del Rio just has that that look to him that just gives off this asshole is asshole ish vibe that's just so cool and gritty. And you can almost want to get behind because it's so cool. And Alberto Del Rio is one of my favorite heels because he's so natural at what he does. Um, it was a pretty back and forth match. Uh, Christian accompanying Edge to the ring. And of course, Del Rio had Ricardo Rodriguez, who was awesome. Um, Ricardo made Del Rio's character, without a shadow of a doubt. And then you had big badass Rodas Clay at ringside. Um, Christian hit, hit a Tornado DDT to take Brodus Clay out of the match. Um, that looked really good. Um, 
Only problem I had with this match was the non-selling of Del Rio's armbar. Like, it seemed like when Edge got out of the armbar, he didn't really sell much of it. He just hit a spear on him. He didn't really sell the armbar that much. And also, if you're going to build Del Rio up as big as you, it looked like you were going to do, then the thing to do would have been to have Del Rio go over, you know? I mean, later on that year, this year, he would go and he would win uh, the Money in the Bank. He'd win the WWE title. But so I guess if you had a big push for him down the line, I guess it was justifiable. But I still think that maybe the real should have went over. But it was Edge's last match, so maybe they made the right call to have Edge go over. Um, pretty, pretty decent match. Um, I gave this a three point two. Um, it was a great opening match. It was a perfect opening sequence. Um, and I kind of take back what I said just now because if the real would have went over, it would have broke tradition. And, you know, I always say in every one of these pay-per-views that I do, you always want to have your face go over to start off your pay-per-view because that gets the crowd excited. That gets the crowd hot. Um, so, yeah, that's that. We go to uh, Rey Mysterio and Cody Rhodes. This... Was uh, there was two. I don't want to skip around too much, but there were two undercard matches that really stole this show. And it was Mysterio and Rhodes and CM Punk and Orton. And I'm going to talk about CM Punk and Orton later. Um, Mysterio and Rhodes was awesome. This match is the epitome of what psychology and wrestling is all about. Uh, the backstory of this match was that uh, Rey Mysterio took out Cody Rhodes. Uh, before the Royal Rumble with a 619, a Mysterio had the knee brace gimmick on and he hit Cody Rhodes in the nose and he had to get reconstructive surgery. Took him out of the Rumble, almost took him out of Mania. So Cody Rhodes went into this match with revenge on his mind. And I talked about Cody Rhodes in my roadblock video. You can go back and watch that. Cody Rhodes basically ran with every gimmick that was given to him. And I really dug this gimmick that Cody Rhodes had here. He had the little plastic mask on and he was demented and dark and the music that Jim Johnston came up with was just so cool. I mean, it was just awesome how it was just so slowed down and dark. And Cody Rhodes took that gimmick and he ran with it. Uh, the high spot in the match for me that I enjoyed, that I'll always remember, is Cody Rhodes had Mysterio on the top rope. Uh, Cody Rhodes was standing on the second rope. And he got Rey Mysterio up in a, su in a suplex position. And it was a stalling suplex. And Cody Rhodes just held this suplex for like, I don't know how long. It had to have been at least 25, 30 seconds. And then he just delivered the suplex. And it was the coolest thing ever. Um, the only thing I didn't like about it was Rey Mysterio's feet were swinging up in the air. But even despite that, Cody Rhodes was still able to hold him. And keep him balanced long enough to slam him for that suplex. That was really cool. Um, and the irony of the finish. Cody Rhodes used Rey Mysterio's knee brace. Like he tore Mysterio's knee brace off. And I think as Rey Mysterio was going for the 619. Cody clobbered him with the knee brace. And hit the crossroads on him and pinned him 1, 2, 3. I thought that was a ironic finish. It was really, really cool. I enjoyed that. Um... Moving on, I'm going to talk about some of these backstage segments towards the end of the show. I'm not going to really get into it right now. Um, there was an eight-man tag team match. It was the core comprised of the world tag team champions, Heath Slater and Justin Gabriel, the Intercontinental Champion, uh, Wade Barrett, and Big and Ezekiel Jackson. I almost called him Big E. Versus the team of Big Show, Kane, Santino Morella, originally Vladimir Kozlov, but he got took out at Wrestlemania Access and I think what that was is they just realized that Kofi Kingston would have been a better replacement than he was um, that being said the match didn't go very long um, it maybe went two minutes if that um, and ended with a Cobra on Heath Slater and a knockout punch by the Big Show and that was it um and I've always, Heath Slater is somebody I enjoy watching because that guy knows how to sell. And he sold the shit out of that Cobra and he showed the shit out of that KO punch. So props to that guy. 
Okay, I skipped all my ratings for those three matches, so let me go back. Um, first match, World Heavyweight title match, Edge, Edge Del Rio was 3.2. Um, Mysterio and Rose was a 3.5. The eight-man tag was a... I have it somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, 0.8. Okay. So now we're on Randy Orton and CM Punk. Um, this... I didn't like how this match was built. I really didn't. Because they shoehorned an incident that happened between Punk and Orton. At this point, it happened three years ago where CM Punk got punted in the head and then got took out of the World Heavyweight title match at Unforgiven in 2008 where Punk was, I guess, was defending the title and he got took out. So they shoehorned that into this three years later with... CM Punk interfering in the WWE title match with Orton and Miz at the Royal Rumble with Punk hit the GTS on Miz or on Orton and uh, this was after Miz was knocked out from an RKO Punk dragged Miz over to Orton's prone body Miz 1-2-3 and that's how this feud got started for Mania um, I didn't like that however I did like the build where they had Orton basically take out every member of the new Nexus prior to in the weeks building the WrestleMania, so that it would just be CM Punk versus Randy Orton. Um, they did a, a really good job um, with psychology in this match too. And Orton selling that leg. I mean, Orton is a good seller too. I've always liked how Orton sold the super kick uh, whenever he would get super kicked by Michaels or Ziggler. Orton did a really good job in selling that leg. He even tried to go for the punt. And he fell because he couldn't get it. Although I do think that that was kind of him playing possum. Because Punk would approach him. Uh, or would go for the RKO and Punk would quickly you know, maneuver out of the way of that. And then we see the famous RKO springboard move that ended the match. And what's funny um, is me and my friend are musicians. So, like, whenever we'd watch Randy Orton come out, we'd watch his entrance video. And how it would go is, you know, you would hear the, I hear voices in my head, they count to me, they understand. And then, like, on the downbeat of, they talk to me, at the same time, you'd see Punk's head in Orton's uh, arm getting RKO'd. So, right on that downbeat of, they talk to me, they boom, right in the entrance video, you'd see Punk getting RKO'd. And <laughs> we just always looked at that and laughed. I thought it was funny. Um, I skipped some spots in this match I really enjoyed. Um, Punk did a good job of attacking the leg. He did one of my favorite spots, the figure four on the post. I always enjoy that. I always like when Brett did it. He even busted out an Indian death lock. Uh, just basic psychology. If you know the leg is hurt, it's hurt. Work on the legs. That's what Punk did. Uh, Punk also had an interesting counter to the RKO where he did like this weird front kick to the fa to the face that was kind of cool. That was the first attempt to at the RKO. Um, this match was a 3.7. I mean, these guys worked really well together. Um, they would have a string of matches this year. I think they had one at Extreme Rules, so I actually might check that out too because I do remember I do remember that being a good match. Um, yeah, so far so good. I mean, in comparison, better than WrestleMania 11. But then the show goes down. I mean, down where? Down there. Jerry Lawler versus Michael Cole. Now, this match was... Uh, hold on a minute. Wait, I'm getting a phone call. I'm sorry. Hold on. I got to turn my music off. I'm getting a phone call. Let's see. Hold on. I got, who is this? Hello? Oh, Hogan. Hey, what's up, man? What's up, brother? How you doing? Hey, congratulations on your, your lawsuit, by the way. Got a million bucks again. $115 million? That's great. Well, you're mad. Well, why are you mad at me? What did I do? What are you talking about? The WrestleMania 9 video. What, you're mad because I gave your match with Yokozuna a point three? Well, can you blame me? That match sucks. I mean... What match could possibly be worse than Hogan and Yokozuna at WrestleMania night? Uh-huh. Uh, Michael Cole and, and who? J Jerry. Oh, Jerry Lawler. 
Oh. Well, Hulkster, you know what? You might have a point. You may have a point there. I'm actually in the middle of reviewing WrestleMania 27 right now, and I'm actually on that match, so... Uh, okay, well, yeah. Brother, yeah, okay. Rip the shirt, and... No, I have not said my prayers today. No, I have not eaten my vitamins today. No, Hogan, I, I have not done that. Okay. Well, all right. All right, bye-bye. You have a nice day. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, Hogan is, uh, Hulk Hogan is very upset with me at the moment, uh, for dissing his, uh, his WrestleMania match with the Yokozuna at WrestleMania 9, but he has told me that arguably Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler was worse, and I actually have to disagree, but I will definitely say that this match was a damn near 30-minute match that shouldn't have been, and it absolutely, absolutely pisses me off that Daniel Bryan and Sheamus gets bumped in favor of a rock promo and in the favor of this shit fest. And I don't give a damn what you do to this match to make it better. You could put Stone Cold Steve Austin as a, as a special guest referee, which he was. You can have Jack Swagger in Michael Cole's corner, which he was. It did not make this match any better at all. Um, It's always cool to see Stone Cold. It's kind of like, okay, you have a pile of shit sitting right here and it's just a pile of shit and then you spray perfume on it okay well it smells a little bit better but it's still a pile of shit and that's what this was man it was 30 minutes of shit um it michael cole didn't do a damn thing um except work on waller's legs he got the ankle lock on waller then waller got out of it then waller did his signature moves i would have loved to have seen waller power driver cole but I don't think Cole knows how to take it. But I think Lawler slammed him. He did a drop kick. Old man drop kicks. I love old man drop kicks. Did a drop kick. Did the fist drop off the top rope. And then did an ankle lock. Match over. Austin rings the bell for a tap out. Lawler wins. Or so we thought Lawler wins. And then the anonymous Roger and manager comes on and says that, uh, well, Austin physically got involved in the match and reversed the decision and made it so that Lawler got disqualified. And Cole wins the match at WrestleMania. Thus, him being undefeated at WrestleMania. Oh, man. The best part about this match was seeing Booker T get stunned. Because that shit was hilarious. Uh, Josh Matthews took a stunner. Jack Swagger took a stunner. Stone Cold was just the best part of the match. That being said, the match was still a one. Sorry, Hulk. It is still better than Hulk Hogan and Yokozuna. I'm sorry. Nothing much to say about that. Moving on. Um, Undertaker versus Triple H. Uh, this is a 3.8. I usually don't do not do the, uh, the rating so quickly. But I think what happened with this match is, in my mind, I had put this match on such a high, spe on such a high pedestal. But then when I go back and watch it, I just realize it's really a spot fest. It is literally a spot fest. The whole match is finisher spamming and spot fest. That's it. It's like the coal mine didn't sell. I think Triple H spear taker into the coal mine. And then <laughs> like the coal mine didn't sell. Like it just kind of fell and then it just... <laughs> like, I don't know whether they were trying to break the glass or not, but I don't know what the fuck happened. Um, there was a spot where Triple H tried to pedigree Undertaker through the table, and then Undertaker gave him a back body drop. Undertaker is 6'10". That table is at least a foot and a half, two feet up. That's like a nine-foot drop. Fuck your back and fuck that spot. <laughs> that is just ridiculous. Um, but like I said, it was a spot fest. There was that, then Taker did the Undertaker dive, and then there was a spine buster where Undertaker ran at Triple H, and Triple H caught him, and then spine busted him to the table. Literally, it, that was what it was. It was those three spots back to back, but it, of course they were resting after each spot, because there was a spot, then they were down. There was a spot, then they were down. There was a spot, they were down. Then it went into the, the ring. It was a choke slam. Kick out. 
they attempted the last ride spot, and I think Triple H got out of it somehow. But then they ended up going back to the last ride spot. And I'm talking about that stupid-ass corner spot where you get a guy in the corner, and you get on top of the Undertaker, and you punch him, and then he gives you a last ride. They did that spot, and I fucking hate that. I hate that last ride spot. It's so overused, and it's so predictable. And then we get finisher spamming. Uh, three pedigrees. It Undertaker kicked out of three pedigrees. Um, Undertaker kicked out of his own tombstone delivered by Triple H. Then Triple H kicked out of a tombstone. It's like it it just it kills the suspense and it buries the move. Three pedigrees. Really? Oh man. Um. And then Triple H grabs a sledgehammer, and then he gets caught in the Hell's Gate. And this this was kind of a cool spot to see. Because you saw Triple H raise the sledgehammer up like he was going to nail Undertaker in the ribs. But then he drops the hammer, he picks it up, he drops it again, then he taps out. Now, if you watch my WrestleMania 11 video, I bitched about how I thought that the clothesline finish for King Kong Bundy was some bullshit. And I didn't acknowledge any WrestleMania match that didn't end in a tombstone. And I gave this one a pass because they were trying to tell the story. And the story that they told was magnificent. I mean, Undertaker got Triple H to tap out to the Hell's Gate. But Triple H, the winner of the match, was able to walk away. And Undertaker... No, but Triple H, the loser... Triple H... Sorry. Triple H, the loser of the match was able to walk away on his own accord. Now, Undertaker, the winner of the match, had to be carried out. So, in Undertaker's mind, that was a loss, which necessitated the rematch for Undertaker and Triple H at WrestleMania 28, which is the only match in ever that I've ever given a five to. Ever. Um, but I digress, because we're still talking about WrestleMania 27. Um, like I said, I, I think I put this match on too high of a pedestal. It was, like I said, it was a spot fest, finisher spamming, and the only thing I kind of liked about it was the finish. But I still rated it high. It was a 3.8. Um, because with those two legends, they can get away with shit like that. And it's 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 acceptable in my eyes. Uh, then we go to a six-person tag, which was your bathroom break, toilet break, piss break, whatever you want to call it. Um, it was... The team of John Morrison, Trish Stratus, and Snooki. Uh, if you don't know who she is, uh, she's that one of those bitches from the Jersey Shore. I guess the most popular one. So it was that team versus Dolph Ziggler and Lay Cool, Michelle McCool and Layla. Um, this was lame as shit. Uh. Trish Stratus and Michelle McCool were the only legal ones in this match. John Morrison did a starship, well, did a starship paint that didn't even land properly on Ziggler on the outside. Um, Trish got a couple of shit in. Trish tags in Snooki, and I mean, I give props to Snooki for being athletic enough to do a cartwheel thing, and then she did another cartwheel splash and pinned Michelle McCool. Um, props to Michelle McCool for selling that and taking a fall for a celebrity but uh that match was a point nine. that was take it or leave it um but now let me just talk about some of the celebrities we got Snooki we had Snoop Dogg that actually had a semi funny segment despite how funny it was despite how cheesy it was um Snoop Dogg's always been kind of cheesy in these situations whenever we see him at Wrestlemania or whenever we see him on Raw or whenever we see him in the WWE uh, Pee Wee Herman had a backstage segment with The Rock. And, I mean, this WrestleMania wasn't too celebrity heavy like it, like WrestleMania 11 was, thank God. But it definitely had some celebrity celebrity sprinkled in there. Um, they didn't really add to it, but they didn't really so much take away from it. So I guess I was cool with it. Um, then we go to the main event, which is just, oh my God, so disappointing. Um, tell me why the high point of this main event match with Miz and John Cena, the high point are the entrances. That's the best part. 
of this match. It is not even a part of the match. Um, I really enjoyed Miz's entrance. I didn't mention Triple H's entrance earlier. I really enjoyed that too. But Miz's entrance was cool. <laughs> that was a cool entrance. Um, John Cena's entrance was stupid. I don't know why he had the gospel choir. I don't know whether they were trying to appeal to the ethnic group in the Atlanta area, in the Atlanta Georgia area, because there's a lot of uh, African Americans. So maybe that's what that was. I don't know, but it was stupid. Um, that match was a 2.9. Absolutely nothing miserable in that match. Memorable in that match at all. Um, there was a side effect that Miz did. Matt Hardy was no longer with the company, so fuck it. Let's just steal Matt Hardy's move for no reason. Um, Miz kicked out of the AA, which not a lot of people do. So I guess that was that was I guess that was somewhat remarkable. Um, the match ended. I guess there was eight matches on this card, but technically there were nine because this match ended in a countout, <laughs> a fucking countout. This is the biggest show of the year in your main event and in a count out. A double count out. So this was set up from a clothesline. I guess Cena did this weird clothesline, which, which was very unsafe, by the way, because the back of Miz's head smacked off a of concrete. And justifiably, that would take Miz out for a 10 count. Cena, I'm not sure why. Because that's the way the match was booked, I guess. But anyway, uh, it ended with a double count out. The Rock comes out and restarts the match and makes it no disqualification, uh, no count out, conveniently so The Rock can get involved and Rock bottoms Cena. So The Rock, Rock, now this is the second match now. The Rock, Rock bottoms John Cena and Miz covers him for the one, two, three. And then WrestleMania ends with The Rock getting in the ring and whooping Miz's ass. So, WrestleMania 27 ended with The Rock standing on the turnbuckle after just whooping Miz's ass. And the problem I have with this, like I said, I'm a Rock fan. And here's the thing. It's not that I'm pro Cena. It's not that I'm pro Miz. It's not that I'm necessarily even pro Rock. I'm pro the fucking WWE title being the focal point of WrestleMania. Or the World Heavyweight title. Or whatever that should be the focal point. Of WrestleMania, not the host at all. And I cannot stand it when they put the WWE title on the back burner. That's what the shit should be about. The WWE title, not about you slept with my wife or I took your girlfriend or, um, you know. No, it's about the WWE title. I hate when they put females, I ain't going to say bitches, but I hate when they put females in the forefront of the WWE title. Like with Ric Flair and Macho Man fighting over Elizabeth. God rest her soul. Elizabeth is not important. That's not what that match should have been about. It should have been about the WWE title. Same thing 10 years later with Triple H and Stephanie. That was the main event of WrestleMania 18. Not that was what the focal point was. It was Triple H and Stephanie. Completely forget the fact that Chris Jericho was your undisputed champion. No, let's focus on Triple H and Stephanie's divorce. That's the focal point. And now you got, or another one, WrestleMania 25, uh, the World Heavyweight title match. Not that that match was important anyway, because nothing was beating Shawn Michaels and Undertaker. And I've talked about that in my earlier video. But the focal point of that was Vicky. Big Show and Edge fighting over Vicky. At least Cena was fighting for the belt. But it was overshadowed because Big Show and Edge were fighting over Vicky. But anyway, this match here... The WWE title was not important. John Cena was not important. The Miz was not important. The Rock was the focal point. This angle was about The Rock and John Cena. And you son of a bitch, you sacrificed your main event... Of your biggest show to set up for next year's WrestleMania. That would be like the, the that would be like the Panthers and the Broncos ending the Super Bowl in a tie and not going to overtime to set up for a rematch at next year's Super Bowl. You know how stupid that sounds? 
They did. They did that. They did that at WrestleMania 27. They literally used the main event of that show to set up a main event for WrestleMania 28. Absolutely despicable. There is absolutely no reason on God's green earth that that should have happened. And you wonder why The Miz hasn't been um, champion since 2011. Because The Miz was barely relevant when he was champion then. But yeah, that match got a 2.9. Uh, overall average rating, 2.4, 2.47. I'm not even going to round up and give it a 2.5. I'm going to give it a 2.47. That's what the fuck it was. Um, WrestleMania 27 was a letdown. WrestleMania 27 was an absolute letdown, um, as far as main event matches go. Uh, Triple H and Undertaker was good, but it was just good because they're Triple H and Undertaker. Not because the match was necessarily, was necessarily good. Um, the WWE title match is not even worth mentioning amongst other WWE title matches in the history of that company. Uh, the undercard was absolutely excellent. Um, like I said, Punk and Orton, Edge Del Rio, which I guess technically was a main event, but Punk and Orton and Cody Rhodes and Rey Mysterio, the undercard matches were really, really good. Um, yeah. This was a letdown, guys, to me. Um, but yeah, this has pretty much been my review of WrestleMania 27. And uh, like I said, coming up, man. WrestleMania is two weeks away. We got two Raws left. This shit's getting hot. Uh, coming your way, I'm probably going to do a couple more WrestleMania reviews. Um, then, of course, we got NXT Dallas, which I'm going to be watching and reviewing. Probably that night. We got WrestleMania 32 predictions. And we got WrestleMania 32 itself. Review. The day after or whenever I decide to do it. So I got a lot of interesting shit coming your way. Um, I'm Warren E. Freeman Jr. I'm an admin over on Yes Wrestling. You can find me on Facebook on Yes Wrestling. You can search my name. Warren E. Freeman Jr. Find me on Facebook. And then you can find me on Twitter at at BlackReaction89. Find me on Instagram so you can like this pretty face uh, at WEF1989. I'm your boy, Warren Freeman. It's been real. You guys have a wonderful day.